Buzu, Kate Nindijnikos, Bikdagon Nishnabek, and Doji. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Kate. My family comes from Pick River First Nation, and here we are again. Welcome to today's Women's Health Talk with Dr. Alexa. Today we are gathered together to learn about child development and emotions and traditional parenting. To lead us in this knowledge is once again, Dr. Alexa Lesperance, miigwech for being here, Dr. Alexa. Um, and before we begin and to start us off in a good way, I'm going to light a smudge and send that everybody's way. Just asking the creator to send some calming energy to everybody that's listening to our live today. Right now we're going into the raspberry moon where we lean on gentleness and kindness and that knowledge that will help us in raising our families. We ask the creator to provide a stillness in everybody's hearts and minds so that we can take the lessons that are taught today by Dr. Alexa with us into our own families and our own homes. Is Okay, so for those of you that are joining us for the first time and those of you who have joined us before, um, just to be able to create a safe learning environment for everybody, um, you will not be able to turn on your mics or your cameras. Um, and any questions or comments that you leave in the chat will be shared with Dr. Alexa for her to answer. Um, we will have a 10 minute break somewhere around the midway point. So at that time, if you need to use the washroom or grab some tea or water, you can uh, do that. And then also lastly, we will be providing a survey link again. And we very much appreciate everybody that fills these out. The feedback really helps us to gauge um, what we're doing with these talks and the direction that we wanna go. And everybody that fills out the survey will be entered into a draw to win a prize. Um, and then finally, we just wanna say miigwech to Dr. Alexa again for uh, joining us today and leading us in our learning journey. Um, today we get to learn about how we can honor our families and we look forward to taking in this knowledge. So if you're ready, I'll pass Hi. the mic to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Kate. You're welcome. Um, so I think, yeah, to clarify, so people can turn on their cameras, they just can't see each other, but I can see you, so I'm happy if you do that. Um, but uh, yeah, so Buju, Masabe Kwe, Indishna Kaas, Nakwa Ndodem, Bijanawabe Zagi, Indishnaabe Kwe, Indonji, Nokta Mingwani, Indonji, Indishnaabe Kwe, Indal. Um, so my name is Alexa, I'm a Anishinaabe family doctor, like um, uh, was mentioned, so today we're going to be talking about child development and emotions and how that relates to traditional parenting. So this was kind of a topic that bridged off of 
last month, which was talking about uh, ADHD. So, um, and then lots of questions arising about, well, like how, like how do children develop? What, what can we do to support them? Um, let me see if this works. Great. So I'm from the Bear Clan. I originally went to medical school here at the Northern Ontario School of Medicine and then did my residency training uh, with UBC at the Indigenous Family Medicine Program, which was amazing because I got to work with almost exclusively Indigenous preceptors, so other Native doctors who were training me and other Native patients. Um, I do locum services, um, so that means I just kind of provide different services to the different clinics. Someone say goodbye. Um, and yeah, also do th things like this, like presentations that are just a general knowledge and education. Um, we definitely try and keep this as interactive as possible, and I do um, try and answer all the questions, and if I don't, pretty much they get sent to me and then I'll email them. Um, but I, I think um, what we'll do is, as you have questions, we'll try and keep track of those and I can answer them. Um, because a lot of the times I'm presenting the information that I think is useful, but like, I wanna be able to answer questions and um, essentially be like a, a trustworthy source uh, for you to answer your questions. So I always talk a little bit about who I am because I think that centers this presentation and also, I don't know, I always joke that I don't trust doctors. <laughs> so I'm like, I need to know about you and who you are and what you stand for um, really before, before trusting you. So um, on the left-hand side here, so this is um, me. I did a traditional medicine camp for about four years. I started it while I was in medical school. Um, really, I have uh, medicine people, traditional medicine people that are in my family, so I had exposure to this from a young age, but did more like formalized mentorship while I was in medical school because I wanted to be able to walk in both of those worlds. So this is just me receiving my bundle after the four, year, four years of um, work to identify, um, to sit with the medicines, to be in ceremony with the medicines. And um, yeah, I'm very like baby, baby knowledge. Um, so I'm like, so don't ask me any questions <laughs> about traditional medicines. Um, but I, I think uh, con concretely how I do that, having a Western trained brain for medical school and then knowing about traditional plant medicine ceremony is one, I'm comfortable when people talk about that and how that's a part of management for their care because oftentimes um, our culture is a treatment for a lot of conditions. And as well, um, there are times where like certain plant medicines where I'm like, okay, like I like feel comfortable telling people about this, but essentially um, I'm definitely of the belief that until I've sat with those medicines and until I'm fluent in the language, I don't actually think I should um, be like handing out very confidently traditional medicine. Um, so that's just where I am in my learning. Um, so this is just me harvesting some of the medicines that I've um, collected before and what it's like for me in the clinic. So how I, so this talk, I think it's important to bring in our medicine wheel and the four sacred directions um, because it's coming from the East. So babies and children bring the teachings of joy, love and happiness to their families. Um, Wabanong, you know, it's the time of mourning, it's a new start, it's like spring, um, often the stage of life is being a baby, the, the place is spirit, um, and being a child or an Abenongi, a little, a little baby, is time, the, the job of that small person, that baby, and that child is to learn to bond and to be nurtured. Um, because as they grow, those are their formative years. Those are the years that are going to set them up for what their life is going to be like in the future. So the life cycle always begins in the Eastern doorway because that's birth and new beginnings. That's where the sun rises when we start a new day. Um, I also think of like at the beginning or the start, children, um, as well as I guess elders who are getting close to passing, but children um, come from the spirit world. And so they are closest to creation and to the spirit world and so they're they're learning to inhabit their human bodies um, so it's innocence and it's purity um, and we want to be able to have um, wonderful young people so that um, 
well, our nations can grow and our nations can be healthy and well because those are, as we say, the generations, seven generations or the many generations that are ahead of us. A lot of what I do, a lot of what a lot of Indigenous people do is in, in, in consideration of who is yet to come. So this um, brings me to a, the point, a point about um, sacred law. So how I think of this as a physician and as an Anishinaabe person um, is that all children are sacred. And a sacred law, what that means is that those are directions that come from Giji Manadu or creator. Um, it's the, they're founded in spirituality and spiritual gifts. And so children are just that, they are a gift. Um, I was taught and, I'm, and um, am of the belief that children start in the spirit world and they actually choose who their parents are going to be. Um, and they choose to come to the earth plane, whether that's to teach parents a lesson, regardless of the length of time that they're here on this plane, um, children are sacred and they chose us, which I think is just an honor, um, especially for parents that are watching this that uh, your children specifically chose you because of the gifts you share and because they they knew what their life was going to be like with you and or they knew what lessons you needed to learn from parenting. So when we teach children our traditional values, we stay connected to our ancestors, right? Because children are closest to creator, they're closest to spirit. Um, so that keeps, so being engaged, being loving, um, taking care of our children really keeps us connected to all future and also all, all past and children really do make um, some of our most powerful teachers and healers and I, I, it's because of that innocence and that and that purity so um, this is a slide from I think last month which was because we were talking about children who have developmental issues or are struggling um, with different diagnoses and so this we talked about the gift of being different. So this is a photo that's by um, Chief Lady Bird and it was a, as part of a, a blog actually um, by so neurodevelopmental children meaning children with like ADHD, with autism, with FASD, you know there's something in their development that has shifted. Um, those children in particular are an even greater gift to our community um, and so and and it's also normal to feel the weight of the extra work it will take to look after children who have neurodevelopmental issues right you kind of need that extra patient communications a lot of the times in clinics right parents are like I don't know what to do with this kid anymore like I'm dealing with their tantrums and their outbursts and um, so but you know kind of how we went into last time why these why children have neurodevelopmental issues like is kind of up in the air there's lots of different reasons there's lots of different causes um but just that the extra patience that we have to learn and the extra communication is a gift to them and it's a gift to yourself um and your child chose this and chose you because they knew you would guide them in a loving way so know that any work you put in to nurturing the differences in children that will result in spiritually gifted, wonderful humans. That will result in Minogamatsuin, which is children living a good life. Um, and we want that. We want our nations to be healthy and thriving. So as infants, we are born into this world with an attachment system that wires us to expect from others. Like we need to expect from others. And this wiring or this attachment system is there whether we want it to be or not. So it's not, um, like, you know, a child can be like, ah, oh, I don't really want to be like bonded with this person or like, I don't want my nervous system connected. Um, you know, but it, 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 children have no option. So, right. Because babies, they can't meet any of their needs. So in order to survive the way that, um, we as a people have developed, um, is that in order to survive babies have to bond and attach to caretakers because you know, to provide food, shelter, psychological comfort, biological comfort, um, emotional attunement, which we will get into, but that's essentially like when you hold and sit in an emotion, you regulate your nervous system, and then, you know, your children are in contact with your skin, whether that's a hug, holding your hand, a touch, um, or they're just in your vicinity, 
Um, and there's that warm responsiveness um, and, and, and calmness that comes with that. So children have no option. They have to be this way. Um, and it's interesting because a child attaches to a caregiver regardless of the quality of care received, right? Because that, that wiring, that attachment, like we can't change, we can't cut it out of someone's brain and be like, okay, try not to do that. It's just inherently built within us and our bodies develop that way. So even if a caregiver was abuseful and neglectful, the infant kind of, you know, doesn't have the awareness to, to change that. Um, and so we have to really be conscious of the signals and cues that babies give us because they are really depending, really depending on us. Um, so at birth, so the newborn, so this is a baby and a ticonoggin. So the newborn's brainstem and their spinal cord are mature. So that means like the, the extent of their function when you're first born is, you know, they can root for food, which is um, like when you kind of scratch on the side and babies are like, you know how they try and like suck your finger because they're like, oh, there's some rooting, like maybe there's some food there. Um, suckling, um, you know, they, they, they're part of the brainstem and the spinal cord is being able to respond to being dropped um, or like the fear of being dropped. Like what's the worst thing that could happen to a baby? They're just kind of living their life, like pooping, peeing, crying, living, loving, <laughs> you know, they're having their grandest self, but um, the things that they're fearing aren't the things that we are. It's, it's like, the, the physicality and so babies have a really good startle reflex that's normal that's a part of their development um and so there's only really two emotions um some could argue differently but essentially like the emotions that you can see from a from a baby are contentment or distress so this child looks like they're content um but because they can't calm themselves they can't self-soothe they have to borrow your emotional control or emotional control from a caring adult who responds to them. And that's why we need many people around our children. That's why we say, you know, like it's not, um, uh, like the way I think of family isn't like mom, dad, sister, brother, you know, this like very, um, like kind of isolated way of, or isolated family dynamic, right? We're, we're connected to our aunties, to our cousins, to our other siblings, um, to our community. And so being able to borrow emotional control from caring adults, it makes a difference. Whether you have children or not, that kindness that you extend to children and the, and the um, wisdom and the more experiences you help them have, like we are, we are contributing to um, our children being well. So the main learning, so a baby's job, like I said, is to be loved, is to be nurtured, um, and for the baby to gain trust, right? Because they're just like living their grand life in this little dick and noggin. Um, and they kind of are trying to figure out, can they trust that their needs will be met? Um, and I think when we talk about development, that's, that's really the most, one of the most crucial bits. Obviously there's the stuff before pregnancy, right? Like what happened? Um, during the pregnancy, where there are substances on board, right? There's all these other factors that contribute to like before the baby was created, while in utero, and then afterwards. But in terms of brain development, this is where we have to really build trust. The, the focus is, is, is needing to do that. Because if, if, if a child's needs aren't met, essentially what happens is they get stuck in survival mode. And then they have a hard time developing higher functions, right? Because like basic hierarchy of needs, like we need safety and order. Like that's the first and for formal, first and foremost thing that we like is essential for us to like have higher thinking about like what we want to do in the world, what we stand for, our identity, right? Safety is the baseline. So if um, children are stuck in that fight or flight or they're frightened, um, they may go back into that survival mode. Um, and this is also, we'll talk about this eventually, like what tantrums are. Um, but that's essentially where tantrums are kids reverting back to their survival mode of fight, flight, or freeze. And that's often why tantrums happen is because they're that core brainstem, that function that's like, suck the food in order to live make sure really, like you cry for attention, like the thing that's telling the baby to keep itself alive, um, the survival mode, it, it gets activated. 
Um, and so it's hard for words to reach children as they as they age because, right, they if if they're stuck in a certain state of mind, they won't it'll be difficult for them to progress right to the next step what is expected what is the next step so like i said so this is the brain stem um breathing heart rate temperature great we're learning all of those things um so how could we help babies when they're when their job is to be loved it's to love them so hold me um to help me feel emotionally and physically safe um, if I'm frightened or stressed, my brain goes into survival mode, which is like the brainstem function, meaning like it doesn't matter what's online or offline because your brainstem is always online. That's the survival bit. Um, and the baby, babies can't really um, grow and develop into healthy adults unless they feel safe um, and, and therefore be able to learn. So there's something called attachment theory, um, which I think like, I don't know, there, there, I don't know, there were psychologists who like did a thing, blah, 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 blah. But we, and as indigenous people, we kind of already know this. Um, like when I showed that picture of that baby in that, in that Tikkanogan and that being attached um, to the parent's back, right? Or being able to hold your child or, or being able to have skin to skin contact, right? There's already indigenous understanding of attachment theory, but essentially you need secure attachment. Um, and in order for a child to get that, they generally need to have experienced a family environment that's mostly warm and supportive. Caretakers ideally are accessible, available, and responsive to their needs enough of the time, right? Because none of us is perfect, no one is perfect. Um, so being a parent is a really tough job. And so it's not like, it's majority of the time being there, being able to be responsive to help your child. Um, and so that way when children reach out, they have an attack, they, they have a need, so they need to act on the attachment they have with someone, they reach out, um, and you move towards them in an emotionally attuned way that calms their nervous system, right? Especially like, there's this thing where, um, uh, people are like, oh, if your baby's crying, just leave them. And that actually isn't true, um, because babies, their only way to communicate is to cry. And of course we have to interpret like does this mean you need your diaper changed does this mean you're hungry or like you are, are needing some love like what's the issue right so um i think it's, it is important to respond to your baby's cries um and your children's cries in order to for them to learn that when they have a need whatever that need is in their little brain right whatever that need is and seeing that a trusting adult is gonna come um and do something about it that means that that's an effective strategy right the brain is like oh if i if if, if i alert my parents to the fact that i am hungry um and somebody will come with food and hold me and then there's that positive reinforcement right so but otherwise if we don't do that then those are kind of where we get into the situations like maybe you know where where you're an adult or or you're a teenager and because you haven't had secure attachment like a stable healthy well adult that like wasn't going nuts and angry and wasn't being abusive and violent and you know they were just like cool-headed level people they did their best to live their lives um if you didn't have that you're gonna be searching for that until you find it like it's kind of like that is the initial step that people have to have. Like, so I, I think for my, for myself as an example, like secure attachments for me, at least I feel like didn't really happen until I was an adult. And it almost feels like you're stuck developmentally or emotionally or psychologically. You might even identify with this where it feels um, like, you know, you, you weren't able to like, I don't know, do more stuff um you weren't able to like be as productive or you weren't as emotionally stable until you had a safe secure person maybe that wasn't your parents maybe that wasn't your grandparents maybe that was a partner but essentially you are going to seek a secure attachment and until you have it your brain is kind of stuck and so you're physically growing right you're you're physically your body you know you're going up on the um, percentiles for your weight and for your height 
Um, but psychologically, that's where the inner child gets left behind, right? So when we have that inner child voice of, but what about me? Or, um, you know, I, I feel scared. It's, it's oftentimes that's because there was maybe not the greatest attachment um, during parenthood. So from birth to age three, this is wild to me. One million neural connections are being made per second. So like babies have, I think it's something like a hundred billion neural connections. So everything that happens to a baby is important. Everything matters. Um, does that mean you need to like always be on your A game or like crap, 30 seconds went by. So that means 30 million neural connections, you know, were firing and I was like angry or something, you know, but it, so anything that your child um, doesn't need that, you know, they'll get rid of, but this, I think just goes to show like how important, how like important it is to really focus on those years. Like, I mean, all of a childhood, you know, and, and becoming an adolescent adult, like all of the life stages in our culture are important. But um, I think that like, this is like setting the stage for like how good your coping is going to be in the future. If you're going to be one of those people when you're dating and you're like, I'm not going to open up to this person. I'm not going to trust them because you didn't have secure attachment as a child. Right. So this, it sets, sets the stage for a lot of different things, but so much connection is, is happening, right? 1 million neural connections. And so this is like a picture of the brain. These are the little neurons and there's like a little telephone cord between them. So that's, so they're making the connections, right? Okay. So when the sky is dark outside, I need to go to bed. Okay. I'm going to release melatonin so that I can start the process of sleep. So because they're learning everything, everything is new, every single sight, sound, smell, new. Um, this is um, just like an image of what it kind of actually looks like in the brain. Um, but it's just, I think, helpful to realize like how, like, look at all. So this is the cell body, right? So this is like the thing, the neuron. There's these little extensions that look like trees almost. Those are dendrites. And so those are all of the ways um, and pathways that a brain is receiving information. Look at all of the different ways, like boom, 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 all of these branches, right? To be able to communicate. Um, and then you can kind of see there's this like cord here. And so this is how from one, so this is a neuron. This is the little sheath that is eventually gonna connect to another neuron here. Um, and so when cells communicate with each other, the axon or this thing right here, it sends messages like by electrical impulse. Um, and, and so the dendrites receive that. They're like, okay, cool. Thank you for giving me that information that it is dark outside and we should be sleeping. Um, I'm going to like let our heart rate know to you know, maybe beat, beat a little bit slower or I'm going to close my eyes to try and sleep, right? So like all of these connections are rapid fire happening. Um, and so as cells start to communicate and we start to recognize pattern as children, those synapses, which is just a fancy word of saying connection, those connections, um, you know, are going to start to form and then they become more complex, right? Over time, like I wish all I had to think about or all I had to do was look outside and say like, oh, it's dark out. That must mean it's bedtime, right? But that's not what I think of before I go to bed. There's a lot of complexity um, now and there's a lot of complex connections and branches that are happening, right? Of like, okay, but what's going to be the temperature? Are our sheets clean? Like I better make sure I go to the washroom, right? The, the, the complexity adds to this um, over time. And this process is happening whether we want it to or not. Um, and each neuron, thousands of synapses. Um, so, and eventually um, the goal is to be able to have really good pattern recognition that serves us, that serves us as children, that serves us, right? Like a really excellent thought pattern would be like, when I am hugged by someone that I love, that means that I am cared for, right? And that the, the hug and the being with your parent that the, the emotion of feeling good is connected to that, right? Like that's a really, that's gonna serve you well in the future because then you know it is possible for you to have safe, secure attachments. Look, you, the, your first safe, secure attachment was your parent. 
Um, but you know, babies, they're making tons, tons of connections. Um, like I just think of like, just the rapidness to which this is occurring is astounding. Um, and those connections continue to build through experience, right? So that's why children need like the thorough hands-on in-person multi-sensory experience where, you know, you are the sight, the smell, the taste, touch are activated, right? Because it's like, you know, if it's 700 connections in a second, um, or uh, what was the number, like the 100 million neural connections being made per second, then we need to be able to give kids experiences outside of, you know, just like watching your iPad or like playing video games. I mean, I know that's kind of what kids want to do. Um, but the, the, the parts of their brain, the synapses aren't forming if we aren't giving them that um, experience. So um, yeah, we mentioned this. So neural pathways, the series of connected neurons that send brain signals. Yeah, and so those are the path. So those are the things that are gonna tell us what our habits of thinking are, how we feel and how we act is gonna be like in the future. It's gonna, neural pathways really define what you believe to be true and really explain why you do things the way you do. Um, but going back to the every sight, sound, smell, taste and touch is being filed away for future reference. So I have a picture here of um, some folks that were at a powwow. And the reason why I included that is because we were at my husband's community um, uh, because their powwow was over one of the weekends um, and there was a baby there that we sort of like I don't know just took over <laughs> we're like hey you need a babysitter <laughs> like because the parents were dancing so we just like got a baby and we're like okay like didn't know these people complete strangers but that's okay it's just you know you need gatherings you like trust each other we um, want to be able to like I don't know essentially pass kids off and know that they're going to be safe and not like um, um, like around people who are predators or like, you know, we want that sense of community where like, it's okay if you don't see your kid playing around in the powwow, you know they're somewhere. And you know that collectively because everyone's best interest is um, for the child, that if someone saw a child doing something that could result in harm, even if that wasn't their kid, right? There's this collective babysitting, I guess is what I call it, or um, collective care. Um, and so there was a baby that, uh, yeah, it was like 11 o'clock at night. And I was like, holy man, we can't get this baby to sleep. And then I thought of it. I'm like, think of if you, well, this is with the baby's like fifth powwow or like second or something, which I was like, damn, like this baby is like a couple months old and they've been to two powwows. Um, something to consider though, for just for sound, especially because like where we were sitting was right beside a drum. Um, it's very loud, right? So like sounds are good, but we also like, if you are taking children um, under the age of six to like a concert, a powwow, um, uh, like a sporting event, it's good to have those little earmuffs just because like um, their ears are a lot more sensitive than ours, right? Because they're brand new. So in some ways I was like, ooh, this baby is just like living um, and really, uh, well we didn't have anything so I just like kind of when the drum that was closest to us was playing I would just kind of get up and like walk away and I'm like oh. um, but this baby would not go to bed and so I was thinking like imagine all the sights like regalia all of the sounds the jingles the cones people laughing the smell um like the smell of the smoke and the fire like I just think of imagine experiencing that as a baby for the first time um, it's a lot to file away, right? And they're like, bam, 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 bam. Like they're just making all of these connections. This baby would not go to bed. And then I realized I'm like, well, no crap. Like they're super stimulated, like and interested. Like they would like, would try to sleep and then they would try and jolt themselves awake so that they could um, look and see what was happening to like watch the dancers or like look around. And I'm like, what a sweet, innocent, um, beautiful thing. But because kids are making these connections and because we want to encourage experiences where there's tactile, there's touch, there's, um, you know, there's um, some, something, there's a sensory component to what we're doing, 
Um, children, for sure, they can become overstimulated, especially at the end of a busy day. And you probably recognize this maybe in your kids where you're like, sometimes they've like had a lot of good time outdoors and so now they're tired and go to bed. But also sometimes it's like they didn't have the nap. They like did a bunch of things and now they're wired, right? They're overstimulated. So kids do like need some type of routine in the evenings, especially after busy days because they need time to, to rest quietly and to process all that new information, right? Because all of the like, pew, pew, all of the connections were happening, but now the, the, Abinor, the child needs to be able to like make sense of all of that because they were just ex in those moments they were experiencing, right? What does it mean when I hear those jingles? Oh, probably that there's gonna be some drumming um, when I, when I hear those jingles on the, on those, um, jingle dresses, um, I, I hear, um, uh, you know, the, the way that it sounds and like that I feel good when I hear those sounds, right? Like I have to like make sense of, of what's happened. And so that's why I think it's important to have babies, like, you know, bring your child to all of the cultural things that you do, to all of the workshops you do, right? Children are welcome in those spaces. And I think that's a part of it, right? Is like, yeah, like probably don't really understand the content of what we're talking about, uh, but to be connected, especially when we're doing cultural things because their brains, they're, they're connecting stuff. Um, and we wanna make sure that they, yeah, that they're, that they're connecting, especially cultural activities, because culture I think is what really um, a lot, like indigenous children that are connected to their cultures and their communities and feel grounded in their spirituality and who they are as Anishinaabe people. Um, I think that is really the difference. That's the developmental neuro, that's the de developmental difference that occurs um, and how we can keep our children well is making sure they're connected to those things. So just bring them wherever you go, bring them um, because they're, they're, they're checking things out. Um, I also think of it, like, just that there's a lot of cultural things that we do. Like you ever notice that sometimes native kids, like if they have to sit in a school classroom, they have to sit and they have to like do their little workbooks and they can't really be touching and walking around. And I'm like, holy man, trying to get them to focus versus when you bring, you know, children out to the bush or you bring them to ceremony or you bring them um, and on the, for land-based learning, right? Like, hey, we're going to learn how to set these snares. We're going to learn how to berry pick. It's they're so that way of learning, that way of hands on is such a good way for our children to learn. And it's really unfortunate that in um, public schools or where, you know, schools that kids are learning in, that we don't necessarily have that component because culturally, those are the things that we're used to, right? Like in order to have a birch bark canoe, I need to go out and harvest that birch bark. I need to be able to tell the seasons about when I'm gonna do that. Um, I need to be able to make stuff from it, right? There's like all of these, tactile processes in cultural activities. Um, so I just, I think our ancestors knew what they were doing. They were like, yeah, this is gonna be good. <laughs> Let's do this. Um, and hence why a lot of our traditions still continue, why they still exist. So every day, children are lear learning, they're growing and they're developing. They learn, this is a cute little photo of, it's family time, right? So we see like, how many people, well one, how many people live in your house, um, but just how much family is involved and around. And I'm not talking necessarily about biological family because maybe it's whatever family represents to you, chosen family, cousins, whether they're biological or not, but that whatever your sense of community is, whether that's like you at a friendship center or that's like your aunts and uncles, like children need to be able to learn from their grandparents, from their family, from community members, cousins, siblings, teachers, elders. Um, and parents truly are the first and most important teacher in their lives. Um, and I think, yeah, we it's, it's so amazing to see um, a lot of Indigenous people who are just these amazing parents. Like they're so interactive with their kids. 
Um, and they recognize, and we recognize as a people, how important it is um, to, to be their first teacher. Um, and like I mentioned before, everyone in the community shared responsibility for teaching and watching over children in the community. Hence why, not so much, you know, like lately, like I know that sometimes people get scared, like on our reserve, like when there's random vehicles, and you're like, who is that? Um, right. And there's concern for, for trafficking. There's concern for, um, sexual abuse predators. Right. So there's a sense of like safety in the community, but also like we do need to be aware of those things because um, it's unfortunately very common. And so we, we want the connection, also want children to be protected. And I think um, rearing children, native children, um, they, are, they are watching you. So whether that means that they're watching you like argue with other people, if they're watching you, um, you know, do substances. Um, not that I don't put judgment on any of those things, but whatever it is that you're doing, children are always watching. Even when you're like, oh no, they're just like watching the TV. It's not true because the neural pathways, right, are going regardless of whether they seem like they're focused or not. Um, so we want to, we want to raise them to be healthy and well. Um, so this is a bit more about the um, brain development and ways that you can help. So pretty well every part of the brain from like birth to what's the oldest age we have here, like six years old. Um, that's where like the main lobes in the brain are developing. And the only thing that's really teenage based is um, the prefrontal cortex. But if we think of even just here, the frontal lobe, so age three to 12. Okay, so this is, so how we sort and categorize objects, encourage problem solving, let me be frustrated um, if, um, as I figure things out, help me notice patterns. So like when you climb on the couch and you fall, that's going to hurt, right? So let's notice that pattern. This is, this is what's going to happen. So when we do X, Y, Z, and Z happen. So that part is going on. Um, the parietal lobe, which is, um, that's in charge of your language. So that's where it's important to talk to your babies, sing to your babies, um, and read to your babies. I think one of the like, um, key parts of development that I like to see in our children is when, um, parents read to them. And there's a lot of like native literature books, picture, regardless of what the content of that book is, exposure to more words and exposure to um, children talk, like hearing more words will help the language part develop, right? So, and then listen to children when they talk, right? So sometimes, I don't know, sometimes I don't understand what they're saying. I'm like, I don't know what you said, but that sounds great. I'm so happy, amazing. You know, like, I think my husband, he does a really excellent job of like, children babbling and I'm like clearly we did not know anything that they said um, but he'll respond as if he did he'll be like um oh that like must have been really hard for you today what else is going on and then they'll like be babbling and I'm like this baby's having a full on cover maybe he does understand them. I don't know um ooh, we have thunder here um, so read the same story, the same songs over and over, especially um, when you want kids to memorize. Like there are certain children's books, like I think one of them that I like to read to all children that come to my house is um, Anti-Racist Baby, which is like pretty much how not to be a racist person, like when you grow up, um, but in a children's book. So it's amusing. But like I read that book every time a child comes, I'm like, I want you to know this and to think about this. Um, so yeah, reading, reading and communication and singing. I think that's a really beautiful thing is if you're able to sing to your children and I think of the sound of rattles, right? And like how lullabies are saying to babies, oftentimes they involve a rattle. And so that's that, those sounds, those experiences helping the parietal lobe. Um, so it's in, in charge of language, but also touch. So like, hold on to my hand, give me things to put into my hand. Um, 
I mean, babies will just reach out and grab them anyways, but give children things for them to touch and to learn about um, and to be hands on, like pulling, pushing, pouring, dropping, um, coming and going, right? The ability to move, that's like a part of a child's development. Like, I know we want kids to be like really quiet and like, oh, they're so good. And they're like, they're sitting there, you know, quietly, not really doing anything, but it's normal, expected and better for children to be wild, <laughs> to touch everything, to do everything because like those neural pathways, boom, 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 right? They're getting more experiences. Um, so, so um, I guess the point from that is try your best not to, um, like, of course, create safety around your children. Um, you know, like we don't want someone to fall and break their arm, but know that like that activeness, that wildness, that want to be moving normal. And that's great. We're helping them with this parietal lobe. Um, the occipital lobe. So, so that's like kind of visually seeing something and then it like being interesting or like engaging. So like, for example, that baby at the powwow, like, all of those different interesting things to look at, um, playing games where you follow things with your eyes, right? Like babies like love peekaboo, right? Because it's like a game that's happening where they're seeing your eyes and then they're not. Um, and have outdoor time so that your kids can kind of figure out like they can develop their outdoor vision. Um, really all children should be wearing sunscreen, um, but especially when you're a baby, um, having sunscreen before you go out is, is really important. Um, and just make sure the SPF is like at least above 20. Um, the cerebellum, so that's that's kind of similar to the parietal lobe where there's the element of touch, but this is like the movement. Like, I wanna swim, I wanna go and dance, I wanna jump, roll, let, let your children do those things. Um, and so all of this is happening um, and probably by the age of five, 90% of your child's brain has developed which is like, wow, you have five years to try and like do your best to raise to, cause the, you know, like that's a really small time frame for the majority of your brain to be developed. But like, it's only 10% after age five that like we continue to develop. Um, so really foundationally, we want children to have safe and secure attachments. We want our encounters to, with children to be kind and loving and to allow for experiences um, and to create a sense of community, help children um, do their job, which is to be loved and cared for. And, and then we have a good foundation to start with, right? It's not like all kids who, I mean, think of all kinds of kids in our community who like, they're in foster care, they don't know their parents, they, you know, like the situations are hard. Um, and so that's not to say like, oh, if you didn't get all of what you needed to by age five, like everything is going to be bad, but like that kid is gonna struggle. Like, you know that for the most part that they are. And so do your best um, to really take those years um, very seriously because so much is happening. Um, so, I think it's been about an hour, so we're gonna take a break. Um, let's see what time it is, it's four. Ooh, good for me. Um, can we take, I think 10 minutes is okay? Can we do 10 minutes? Okay. Um, wait, how many more slides? Cause sometimes I say this and then I'm like, wait, I have a lot more to talk about. Okay, we'll do 10 minutes. Um, so we'll have a 10 minute break. So that means we'll be back at four. 406 or 407 um so please just like stand up drink some water drink some nippe um studies have shown that like yeah sitting for longer than 20 minute periods um after that like you're not really getting much um into your brain so please actually stand up to get the blood flow going and we'll see you back here uh around 406 407 our our time you might be on a different time
Okay, awesome. Back from our break. Hopefully you got some water. Um, there was a question. It wasn't particular to this content, but I think it's just helpful information anyways, which is um, the presentations that we do, are they made public on the Onwell website? Would you be able to review it again? And the answer is yes. So all past recordings are available on our Facebook and the video under the video tab. Um, also, most videos and presentations are um, uploaded to YouTube and we have an Onwell YouTube channel. Um, that usually takes like that's not instant like how it is on you know Facebook Live, um, but for this particular um, record, actually we couldn't get the Facebook Live working, so this will be uploaded to YouTube and will be available probably within a week or two. Yeah, but it is reviewable for sure. Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, nutrition because the brain is like expanding so quickly. Um, a newborn's brain is 25% the size of an adult's brain. And by age five, it's 92% of the adult size. Um, you know, kind of when you see babies with like big heads and you're like, what? <laughs> That's because they're brains. There's a lot of growth that's happening. And so when brains are building all of those nerve connections, physiologically, your body needs a lot of energy. You need calories. So a toddler, I don't know, needs up to like 1,000, 1,200 um, calories a day. So I don't know, that amounts to like, I have, I have here like a cup of fruit, a cup of veggies, two cups of milk, um, a couple ounces of protein foods, three ounces of grains, right? Whatever, whatever is composed in their diet, but it's the, it's the calorie uh, bit and having exposure to lots of different types of foods, because remember the parietal lobe, the, the touch, the sensation, um, the tactileness, right? And, and taste, like we want children Children who are exposed to a lot of foods um, early on usually have less allergies growing up. Um, and also like we create, you know, a palate where children are like, or children who become adults are like willing to try new foods. If you're like, no, I eat the same chicken figures craft dinner all the time, right? And you don't eat anything outside of that, then your kids aren't really gonna have a palate or they're not gonna have interest or the curiosity to explore other foods. So just keep that in mind. Um, I know that's not always feasible, like to have all of these, like, wouldn't it be nice if we could have a cup of fruit, cup of veggies, two cups of milk, protein foods, three ounces of grains, like I don't even eat that in a day. Um, and it would, it would be nice. And so there is, of course, food insecurity, especially in our communities. Um, so also being conscious and aware of that, that, um, yeah, like we have to make do with the best that we can. Um, so I really um, encourage folks, like especially if food security is an issue, is to reach out to um, different like nutritional programs, like the Good Food Box, which we have here at Onla, um, which is where like healthy veggies and stuff, like you pay like a very, very small amount um, relative to what would be in the grocery store and you have access to some of these foods. Um, and especially important uh, healthy fats, um, especially because I think we um, mentioned, so those sheets in the brain, like they need fat, like the good fat, which comes from like nuts, fish, um, peanut butter, all of those good things. Um, so yeah, it, the brain is physically and mentally growing. So nutrition is, is important in this stage. Um, there actually um, haven't been um, really solid studies that confirmed that excess sugar, um, you know, stunts uh, children's development. Like they haven't, you know, there hasn't been that correlation. But I do think of excess sugar, um, you know, in the potential that there, that there is the potential to affect brain development. So we don't want kids to be like absolutely zero sugar because glucose is what we need to survive, right? We need some sugars. Um, trying to have your child sugarless is like probably dangerous, frankly. Um, but having excess sugar, like where there's lots of sweets, lots of treats, their main source of like drinking is like apple juice versus water or milk, right? Like those, that excess sugar affects um, well, one, excess sugar creates inflammation, right? Inflammation of the blood cells, inflammation of your body. Um, and because your brain is made up of 
connections and blood vessels, theoretically, excess sugar, especially if it led to diabetes, could really affect um, the blood vessels and just function generally of your body. So just to plug out there to like really try and limit like the ex the extra the extra sweets and candies, which I know in the summertime is is hard, but just being cognizant of that and. Yeah. Also, um, I want you to know that I'm not like giving me suggestions and I'm like, give your kid this fruit and this vegetable because we are dealing with something called colonization. There is um, a stressor. There was an initial um, uh, system, initial insult to our, to how we eat foods, right? Like nutrition. Like sometimes people like, I'll hear people say, elders say, well, like we should be eating our traditional foods. Like those are free. I mean, they're free in the sense that like you had to pay the gas, to drive your truck to go and then hunt the moon. Like, you know, there, there is some cost to it, but the idea that you don't have to go to a grocery store and buy and that we're sharing that available food, right? Um, because some of the, like the main superfoods, which those are like the like anti-cancer, like they have all the hype, like two of the main ones, are wild rice or manoman and blueberries minan so two of our like culturally significant foods are some of the like superpower foods where people are like eat this it's antioxidants which just means like you're telling like the you know like you're telling pollutants and things in the air um you're telling the cells like hey don't break down from all of the stuff that's happening in the environment so it helps just keep cells strong um but colonization, you know, there was a point where fishing and hunting rights, like those were outlawed, um, where hunting lines were disrupted, you know, maybe whether your family does that or not. Um, there's so many things that contribute to like how nutrition like does or doesn't happen in our communities. And so food insecurity, it is cheaper sometimes to buy and eat junk food. Um, and so this, just that I say this because I don't want parents to feel like like that that's their fault that their kid is not getting healthy nutritious food because there is a very clear pathway um, as to like what is contributing to that the high rise high cost of groceries right but um just just like when you can really try and introduce healthy foods um and something that is free um that i think is um, awesome kind of putting a plug out there is breast milk so breast milk for a bajillion reasons is super helpful one like antibodies which are the things that help you fight infections are like transmitted from the parent uh, to the baby through breast milk um, but in particular for the brain and there actually have been um, quite a few like good studies that were breastfed babies they are found to do better on intelligence tests when they grow older um, and breastfed babies eyes just generally like work better and it's it's because of this particular fat so the um the myoinositol um is a certain type of fat that's in breast milk that you know when i was talking about the fat that we needed for like connections to be made breast milk has like the ultra ultra fat that we need, um, all of the nutrition um, that you could possibly need, um, especially for the first six months of life, um, can be found in breast milk, but especially um, the fats, because, so remember, this is a picture of a neuron, and this is the sheath, the myelin sheath, it's like a cord, it's literally like a roped cord, um, and the stronger, so we want we want this nerve to be insulated, right? Otherwise, like if we're just bouncing around and there's like not a lot of protection, right? Those nerves are gonna get damaged. So children, it's easy for them um, to build new connections because they have a lot of myelin, which is the thing that surrounds the nerve. And the thicker this these yellow things are, the thicker the myelin sheath is, the faster electricity conducts. Right. So when we want, because this yellow stuff, it's made of protein and fatty substance. Um, and so that's great because we want positive association, like we write in order to reaffirm those positive associations, babies need fat. Um, and so being able to provide that and make this yellow kind of a buoy looking thing stronger 
means that it's going to be a quicker connection. Um, they're going to be efficient. And so we, we want those types of connections. When, because there are, are so many things that are happening, so we kind of mentioned, so before the age of five, like 90% of your brain is kind of like, you, you have the core of, of, of what you're, um, who you are um, and how your brain structure is going to progress. Um, but if something that happens and has to happen, like if you think of all of those like connections, like we don't need all of them, right? I don't need that random commercial jingle for cereal in my brain, right? Like that, that's not like serving a purpose. So this is like, if you've ever seen the um, movie Inside Out, which is about emotions where they're like, they're like snipping and they're cleaning up the like, what the heck is this? Like, we don't need this. Um, because it gets cluttered. Children's brains, the neurons, it gets cluttered and tangled. And so the ones that they aren't using, those are the ones where your body is just gonna naturally start pruning those and taking those away, getting rid of the essential connections. So this is where, you know, when people say like, use it or lose it, that this is the process that they're describing, which is like, if you don't do something continuously, um, have a pattern around it, have, don't have good associations with it or, or have bad associations with it, right? Because your brain, um, we'll talk about this, but emotions um, that are linked to experiences, right? That makes that experience and that emotion stronger, like they feed into each other. Um, but children do a lot of like the pruning, like getting rid of stuff that they don't need around age 10. So if you're like, oh man, my kid's like getting older and like they're really not active, they're really not interested in sports, like, uh, like we're not creating that pathway of like being active is really fun and it makes me happy. Um, yeah, kind of like try, you, have, you still have time, like try and encourage um, kids to, to do things and get out there because that's, that's when they're cutting away the stuff that they don't need. Um, or the stuff that they think their brain doesn't need. That's, that's kind of crucial. Um, because neurons with little neural activity, you know, they're not having this thick, nice pore, they just get cut. Um, and the brain generally is reward based. And I don't mean like, I don't know, give your child a sticker every time they do something, but the reward of like behaviors, um, uh, because there's, there's the different dopamines here. There's, these are called reward chemicals. So dopamine, endorphins, oxytocin, serotonin, all of the things that make us feel good, um, they are often paving the pathway for these stronger connections, right? So unfortunately, if I have a pattern where every time it's night out, I experience abuse or violence, or every time I'm around this, uh, every time I'm around women, every time I'm around men, um, I experience this awful thing. So the things that happen more frequently, those are gonna become stronger. And so then when we add emotion to it, that makes those pathways even stronger. So neurons that fire, like connect to each other, they wire together. Um, so then that's how activities get associated um, like with like sound, smell. So like, for example, the smell of popcorn, if you smell that and you like, uh, you know, immediately, you know, you like have that feeling, your mind, body, like maybe you feel excitement, you remember like going to the movies, or maybe that smell of popcorn, like brings up deep seated fears because someone threw popcorn at you in the cafeteria, right? So like, there is a very intense emotion connected to that, um, good and bad, but your brain naturally is going to want to focus on the bad. It's gonna, it's gonna, so we have to put effort into positive thinking because our brain is going to remember what sucked about something because they're like, well, we're going to need this in the future. Like, this is the thing that helps us with survival. Joy is great, but like, is it necessarily for survival to breathe, to eat, to function? Well, not, not necessarily. So, so your brain is going to capture the things that are negative a lot easier than it will the positive. And having emotions, especially negative emotions that are connected, those that are connecting those neural pathways, right? Um, that means that they're going to become stronger. So then a thought pattern, you know, that's why sometimes it feels like it's impossible to change your thinking. You're like, why can't I stop being anxious about this thing? Or like what? And it's, and it's because those neurons, the, the emotion and the connection, 
are firing together they're associated with each other and they got stronger and stronger and thicker and thicker until it's it's almost like um what's that thing like we're a highway like um like a super highway where like the connection is just so instantaneously right because the yellow thing around the nerve that the picture that i was showing you that conducts electricity so it's like bam so sometimes when i like I don't know, like if you have a trigger for something, right? You're triggered by something and you had an experience that contributed to that trigger over and over and over again. You continuously had really crappy adults in your life. You continuously um, drank and it made you feel better or it helped, it made you think that you were feeling better, right? And you do that more and more and more until it's just ingrained. Um, and so we often don't get the chance to decide when and how these associations will form we just know that they do right like it sucks if like for example i don't like dogs and it's because a lot of early childhood memories were like of dogs barking at me and like trying to bite me and so now i have this connection right so it's um i, I didn't get to decide that like my brain was gonna make that connection right but it's, it's always online it's always thinking um and so we can either take advantage of this wiring or this wiring can work against us, right? Like patterns of like, well, anytime I feel insecure, I want to lash out, right? Like that's not the greatest wiring um, because that means anytime you're feeling distressed, like the super highway is to lash out or to feel angry, right? So we don't want those associations, like those aren't helpful to us. Um, so this is like, these are all the pathways. So making smart decisions and also repeating the things that you do want your kids to, to know and to believe in and to be good at and to, to have good associations, it requires repetition. So like, if you want your kids to be really good at like where they're like, yeah, they're awesome at brushing their teeth, you have to repeat it over and over and over again. Um, so that those, those 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 connections come stronger and then then you have a kid that you know grows up into an adult and they're like oh yeah i brush my teeth every morning that's just who i am right it's just like what i've been doing um but also being particular of like if children are responding to your emotions and they're building synapses you kind of have to watch your emotions right like you yourself need to self-regulate because they're watching and they're learning and they're modeling based off of what you're describing so if they see, you know, every time mom goes to Walmart and there's a line and mom starts swearing and like cursing and um, like being really angry with the cashier, right? Like if, if they see this pattern of like, oh, when I'm inconvenienced, I should really be rude to people, right? And they see that happening constantly, then that's what they're going to learn. Um, so yeah. And, and it's beneficial right like so we want the, the positive things to wire together we want good emotions to um, be associated especially i think with cultural activities um, and the negative stuff we can't necessarily help what our brain attaches to but just you yourself try and live in a good way so that what you're modeling to kids is is something that they can also pick up on um yeah, going back to this reward um, thing, because sometimes I'll, like, I'll get asked this question um, quite a bit in clinic of like, well, if I just like maybe buy them a toy, like maybe that'll get them to do the thing, which like, yeah, you, you could try that. Um, but know that early on, like before kids have the ability to like ask to play on their iPad, if we um, shift what a reward means in a child's brain, that means like, getting praise hey buddy you did a really good job or like that's awesome like so getting praise um getting like really nice physical touch when you do something like i'm going to give you a hug i'm so proud of you right those emotions whether it's dopamine oxytocin serotonin are rewards um and so the reward to your brain is like great we have relief from any perceived threat um you know because cortisol which is the stress hormone it also makes its way in there to the neural pathways right um and so rewards don't um necessarily have to involve object objects and i don't think they should because then what is the behavior that we're reinforcing right um so but knowing that like that praise or or being given like loving anything 
for good behavior or what we would consider good behavior is enough of a reward because it's a chemical reward. And if we start that early on, then we will have less situations where we have to like convince our kid to do stuff by buying them things. They'll just be like, oh, my mom told me that I did a really good job. Great, there's my reward. Um, yeah, so emotions, they build, they are one of the building blocks for neural pathways. Um, and when there is emotion connected to an experience, your brain becomes even more online. It's like, hey, this is important. If we felt really sad when this thing happened, we should really pay attention to this. And I'm going to be extra acutely aware of anything that makes me sad because one, I want to survive. Two, this information could be important. Like, what if I need this? Like, sadness is, you know, like, it's important to feel sadness and feel the breadth of your emotion. But, like, your brain, it wants to be able to feel good things. It wants to be able to um, redirect you. But it's, it's honestly the negative emotions that your brain is really hyper-focused to. Um, so what are emotions? So it's interesting because it's like, yeah, what is an emotion? Um, how I think of it and how I describe it is um, your mind and your body's way. So like my brain and my heart, their way, their integrated response to some kind of situation, right? So like when I came upstairs to do the presentation and I was like kind of not running late but like I wasn't as early as I normally am my emotion was like ooh, like I feel really really anxious and my mind came up with that based on the fact that I was about to arrive late right being late isn't inherently anxious but because my brain associates being late with like I don't know like oh you shouldn't be late it associates being late with like negative um, feedback, it naturally makes me anxious. So it's your body's response to something. It involves physiological arousal. Um, so that means like, you know, your eyeballs getting wider, they're getting smaller, your heartbeat beating slower, faster, expressive behaviors, like right, what you can see on your face, if your shoulders are hunched, if your arms are crossed, and then the conscious experience. So um, to put this into like an example, um, which seems silly. I'm like, why are we defining emotions? You'll understand in a second. But um, they're, because they're our brain's way of responding to situations, that's what helps us make sense of the world and guides our actions, right? They give us valuable information. How should we navigate our life, make choices, connect with others? Oh, I don't really connect well with this person. I feel angry when I'm with them. Okay, maybe that tells me I need to have a different connection with someone else. Um, but particularly for kids, because they're building attachments, um, they're forming connections and the emotions are like really super highwaying a lot of connections. So this is the example here. So like being hugged by a loving adult. So the, so the emotion that I'm probably going to feel is love. Um, what happened to, to tell my body that I experienced love? Like, how do I know I'm experiencing love? How do I know I'm experiencing anger or sadness? Well, when I was being hugged, my heart rate decreased, my oxytocin released. Um, so that was happening internally. My expressive behavior, I had like hugged the person. I was like, oh, my shoulders dropped, my face softened. And then the conscious experience of like, I feel comforted, I feel loved, I feel cared for. So there's six core basic emotional categories. Um, that's not to say that there's only six emotions, but I don't know. There's a lot of, there's technically a possibly a seventh, which is contempt. But I think I like to understand um, what it is when we're feeling something, what the root is. So for me, I actually have a hard time like, ex like saying, oh, I'm feeling uh, surprise or sadness or fear, right? So like, the, so, so you could be really great where you're like, I know that those are the one of the co six core emotions that I'm experiencing. And honestly, that's how children figure it out. Often for adults, what we have to do is look on the outside and be like, what do I feel? Inadequate, worried, anxious, dreadful, hateful. Oh, horrified. All right. So I'm in the fear. Um, so because emotions, they are giving us information based off of past experience um, and based off of like, like 
the connections that are associated with that emotion. So I think it's helpful. Like I myself have like an emotion wheel at home because I, f I find it really interesting. Like when I'm like, oh, like I feel so like, I feel so frustrated or I feel so um, angry and like what I'm actually describing. Um, I'm gonna move this down actually here because you can't see me very well. It's kind of cut off at the bottom, but that's okay. Um, yeah, like bewildered or shocked. Like in my head, I would think of that as like fear or anger, but like, so being able to identify what the core emotion is, one, children need to be able to figure that out, right? And they usually do that by with verbal and physical cues, but also because it's telling us what we need. I think this is helpful. So when you experience anger, like when you're frustrated, um, for example, like someone cut me off in traffic today and I was like, oh, I'm so angry. What my body is communicating and what my emotion is communicating to me is that something is unfair. Someone or something is crossing a boundary um, or, you know, there's a demeaning offense against me or someone I love or care about, um, which is helpful, right? Because if, if anger, if that's the meaning of anger, if my body's telling me I'm experiencing anger, um, what does, like, does that emotion fit the facts? Like when someone cut me off, was that something that was unfair? I mean, I don't know. There's a lot of cars on the road. Like maybe, maybe not was someone or something crossing a boundary. I mean, like the car maybe was about to cross my boundary. Um, but you know, like, cause, but like, if you got really, really, really angry, like you were just like, Whoa, like giving them the finger swearing, shouting, right? Like then you can check the, like, is anger actually an appropriate response to what's happening? Like, did any of these things happen? Because if not, right, then we need to bring down our anger levels or that we need to tone it down, right? Like this is not, this degree of emotion is not appropriate for the situation that has occurred. Um, what's another one? Fear. So um, when I feel scared, so facing an immediate concrete, um, uh, overwhelming physical danger, fearing for one's life or safety, right? So when you experience fear, like say, for example, um, I wasn't anxious to do this talk, but say I was scared. I was like nervous about, I was scared about public speaking. Um, something that I could use to help my brain is like, thank you brain for telling me that we are fearful. Um, just to let you know, we are not facing an immediate concrete or overwhelming physical danger, right? Like this is a, like, I am being fearful of something that is pretend that I cannot see, right? Like that, you know, maybe the fear is that like, you're going to mess up and you're going to be mortified, right? Um, that isn't really like a true danger. Um, like no one's going to die from that. Maybe it'll suck how you feel, but no one's going to die, right? So then you can kind of tone it down. Like, actually, I don't need to feel fear about this. Like that actually maybe isn't fitting my experience, but say it is, say fear is fitting the experience, then what you need to do when you experience that motion is to feel safe, increase a sense of safety and grounding techniques. Hence why, for example, if I was fearful, nervous about doing the talk, like regard, like I'm not gonna argue with my brain, like this isn't fearful, we're fine, right? Because sometimes that's really difficult to do, especially when there's high intensity emotions, but we could still meet the need, right? I find if, if fear is the thing and I need grounding, great. We do smudging right before this call. That's going to really help me to help bring the fear down, right? Like, especially if I can't really necessarily negotiate the emotion. Emotions, um, yeah, you can't, I don't know, you can't really like talk them down. Like, so you, you like, or it's difficult to do that. You can, but it's difficult. So just fulfill the need and recognize is the emotion fitting the experience? Um, so discuss, so taking in or being close to an indigestible object or idea, something that may damage one's health or, or well-being. So when you feel disgust, what you need to feel safe, you need to expel, you need to keep it at a distance, right? So um, like happiness. So when our body is telling us that we're feeling happy, what does that mean? Well, that means that we're making reasonable progress towards the realization of a goal whatever that goal is, but we're making progress towards that goal. Um, the emotion is happiness, which is great. We're gonna be aware of it. We're gonna enjoy, we're gonna celebrate it and you're on the right path, 
right? Um, but this is, you get that sense of like, this is good for me. This feels really good for me that I'm doing this talk. Um, and I want more of it. I want more of that happiness. Sadness. So when your body is communicating to you like, hey, we're really sad right now. Um, often what's happening is you're having the experience um, of, you know, whether that's loss, something is missing or something is being grieved. And so what if that's the emotion, um, you know, and what do we need? We need soothing and comfort. Like we either need to bring the intensity of that emotion down. We need to distract from that emotion or like we could do something which is freeze, which is not deal with it at all and just dissociate, which um, long term isn't the greatest coping. So if those are seven, well, six, I, six, I say six, six core emotions, um, children often learn what emotions are based off of like what's happening to our face. So sometimes you as an adult might be like, I don't know what I'm feeling. Like, I don't know. Like when someone asks me, like, when I'm, I don't know, in a mood and my husband tries to ask me like, what's going on? What are you feeling? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> but like, okay, if, if I just looked at my body cues, oh, my arms are crossed and my brow is furrowed, um, my eyelids tightened, my lips tightened. Oh, this is anger, right? Like, so being able to like figure out, like if you don't know what the emotion is and you can't work backwards to figure it out, what's happening in your body? You know, I think of like, um, uh, like yeah, the, the fear. So your lips stretched, eyelids tightened, raised, your inner brows are raised, um, or yeah, like anger. Like I, I just think it, it's helpful for to identify to children when you're experiencing an emotion, um, so that they can understand it. Um, and also, these are likely the verbal cues that kind of tell your body, tell your experience, tell yourself that like this is happening. This is, I know that I am experiencing happiness and joy because I am smiling and the lips of my corner, like my corner, the corner of my lips is pulled up. So when kids have really big emotions, um, there's kind of, yeah, these are essentially, these are the options, um, right? Because we, one, the frontal lobe, which is the thing that like helps you reason things out is like offline for the most part, like until you're a teenager, really, um, it's not on board. So that's why kids, when they have emotions, they're just like, why are they so big? Like, why, why was that like a total meltdown for like something where you're like, what? It's because the frontal lobe, which is the thing that's like, oh, we don't need to cry this hard about this, isn't online, right? So emotions have to happen. Children need to experience the full breadth of their emotion in order to develop into healthy adults. And we need to help them with their emotions. Children, like, yeah, we want them to be self-regulating in some way. And I think that's like a part of like the giving space, allowing time and space for to, to get themselves back on track. But for the most part, when we, when kids experience really big emotions, um, especially at the start of their life, we need to help. We either need to co-regulate, we need to problem solve, or we need to listen and allow for those emotions to exist, right? Because if we get mad or we get frustrated at a kid when they get sad all the time or when they're angry all the time then that kid starts to like figure out oh I should really shouldn't feel those things I really shouldn't feel sadness or anger like look how my caregiver responds when I am that way um and then in the future they have issues where they're like super people pleasers and that, that people take advantage of them because they don't want to feel anger but anger is helpful right especially if someone crosses a boundary with you that anger is an important emotion to feel but because it's associated with, you know, an experience or because of how it was or wasn't co-regulated with an adult, now you're kind of stuck with like, oh my gosh, I, I don't want to feel like anger. I don't want to, I don't want to confront anyone. You know, I, I, that makes me feel really scared and upset. Well, yeah, like that essentially like that is probably because of what had happened um, sometime in your childhood development and you've made that association. So as parents, as people who are around children, we really have to be aware of our emotions and how we're acting in the world. So listen, ask about their feelings, help them feel heard, um, help them recognize, right? So like, hey buddy, it really looks like, you know, your arms are crossed and your face is frowning. Um, I can see that I think you might be experiencing some frustration and anger, right? Like helping identify when a kid feels that way, that's what the emotion is. Co-regulate. 
practice calming strategies right alongside them, right? Because your frontal lobe theoretically should be online. So I'm like, we don't have an excuse, <laughs> but children's aren't, but ours are. So we have to really like try and stay calm in those situations because if you respond to emotion with higher intensity emotion, all it's doing is like creating really crappy neural pathways where like it's setting the kid up to not really do that well. Um, so there's the giving space option, distracting, right? So talk about favorite hobbies to give mental separation for a few minutes. Like, you know, when kids are like crying and then you kind of like distract them because you're doing this cool thing. And then the, the emotion has um, the potential to make its way to, to like come down. Like the emotion comes down because they're able to focus on something else, right? So distracting, drawing or writing, drawing or writing to express your feelings, thoughts and needs and, and or problem solving, right? Like if the emotion is anger because the kid can't tie their shoelace, then like a way to help them manage that is to recognize, hey, it looks like you're feeling angry because you can't do this thing. Let's problem solve. Let's tie your shoelaces together, right? Um, but explain to your children that feelings are useful and that it's important and children shouldn't feel bad for feeling them because again, we, we need all of this expression. We need all of this, um, sense because that's going to serve us later on in life. Um, and especially co-regulating to those things. So tantrums, um, which I think a lot of times when I have parents that are coming in and it's like related to behavior, they're like, Oh, my kid always does this thing. Um, they always have like, I don't know, tantrums or behaviors are always hitting, right? So what do tantrums mean? Like, is your kid actually trying to make your life extremely difficult having a meltdown in, you know, the middle of the store? No, because tantrums, like what they are signaling is an, it's an overwhelm, right? It's an emotion that has gotten to the point where it is overwhelming the, the, um, um, and the emotion of the tantrum. So I'm trying to tell you about a need that I have when kids have tantrums, right? Maybe that need is that they actually need to have more boundaries, right? Like, you know, when kids cry and freak out because they couldn't get the thing that they wanted. Um, yeah, the, probably like, I don't know what, whether you should get that, but like whether you feed into that action, but like if someone's a kid is having a meltdown, they're, they're really just like trying to figure out a way to get you to help them calm down. And so this is where kids, they figure out eventually that if they just act up more, they'll get your attention quicker. Hence why when children have emotions, we kind of need to be right there with them. Okay, it looks like this is what's going on. I'm gonna be physically here. I'm gonna be sitting with you. I'm gonna be here while you have this emotion. Kids can figure it out. They start to like calm down, right? But, um, your, their brain is trying to figure out big feelings and we need to help them with that. Um, so yeah, what else could a tantrum be? I don't want to be acting this way. I'm watching or like, you know, kids are like, Hmm, if I throw this tantrum, how is my parent going to respond? Because then I'll know for next time, like what I should do. If I just act up more, I will get the response. So you really want to like early on be on top of those, like, kind of behaviors where like if you just give your kid an extra thing or do an extra thing or like all they had to do was cry longer for you know the toy that they wanted they're going to learn that that's effective and then they're going to learn that that's what they should do as adults oh they're not getting what they want and it's you know like it's they're not getting what they want well then all they need to do is act like in a you know out of control way and they'll get it um, and we don't want adults like that. Like we see adults like that, that could be explosive, violent adults that are like really can't control. And, and that's, that's not like, that's not ideal. Tantrums don't like kids having tantrums doesn't mean that your kid is trying to manipulate you. doesn't mean they hate you, even though your kid might scream that at you, right? They don't, they have overwhelm. They have emotions. They need your help regulating. Doesn't, if your kid has a ton of tantrums, it also doesn't mean that like you, you messed up as a parent or that you're a bad parent or that that child is bad, right? Great. Really glad you're experiencing the extreme of this emotion because you need to experience the breadth of it. I'm going to help you out. Um, and also like really try not to, um, punish based off of big emotions because then it tells that kid they shouldn't feel that emotion, um, across the board, whether it's for good or bad. And we want them to feel everything. Um, let's see here. 
So these are some examples um, of ways to positively reinforce, like to create those neural pathways, to create um, those good emotions and good associations so that they travel together, um, is the, the emphasis being on what children can do um, rather than what they can't, right? So like you um, did such a good job. I'm really glad that you, um, you know, got a certain grade on your paper, your school assignment versus like you didn't get an A plus and that's really unfortunate, right? Like we need to focus on like what, the, what did the kid do and reinforce that part. Don't reinforce or punish what you think should have been the expected outcome because then you're gonna create highly anxious adults in the future. Um, and I am one of them. You are probably one of them. You're all one of them. Um, so also talking to your kid and letting them know like instead of saying like, you know, good job, because we're wanting to make positive enforcement, instead of saying good job, be specific about why you think something a kid did was a good job. What you did was kind and generous. You improved since last time. You didn't give up even when it was hard. I can tell you put a lot of time and effort into this. You look really proud of yourself, right? So there is utility to letting um, kids know and really encouraging when they do something well. Because, right, all they need is that one bad experience where you got really mad at them because they took too long getting outside the door and bam, that connection is formed, right? So really focus on the positive with children. Um, usually at this point in the talk, people are like, oh no, <laughs> wait, all of this development happened by this age and all of these things were happening and like, oh man, what was I doing as a parent? Just want to let you know, you're at uh, about 10 minutes out. So, yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Um, so like, oh no, like, did I mess this up? Did I mess my kid up? Is it too late? Um, and so our brains, so one, no, give yourself some grace. Um, and also remember that there are kind of like life stages, ages where like kids are either pruning or they're learning a bit more. Um, but there's this thing, this great thing called neuroplasticity. Um, which is great news because that means our brains have the capacity to rewire new pathways. So like, even if your kid has this like certain connection, this certain pattern that they do and, and it's continued with them as, as an adult and they want to change it, right? We can, there is the potential because our brains aren't static. It's not like we build one connection and that's it. They're growing. We have the potential to change things, neuroplasticity, the ability to manipulate an organ. That's why this little person is, you know, fixing and tuning up the stuff in the brain. We can change it. Um, and is like your brain isn't not only capable of being neuroplastic and being able to change um, patterns that you don't want anymore. It's wired for that. Remember, remember those little dendrites, those little um, trees that were sticking off the neurons and they're like, let's make all of the connections, right? Like your brain wants to be able to make connections. Um, so neuroplasticity means like you, you can pretty much for the most part, really work to try and restructure, um, reorganizing your stru like structure of things, functions, connections. Um, once neurons are damaged, like irrevocably, like for example, if someone had a stroke, right. And they didn't get any oxygen to certain like parts of their brain, neurons really like once they die, they they die, they don't regenerate, right? But there's the ability of what still exists to rewire. Hence why, you know, like when people like lose function of like a, like a, an organ or a limb or something and then something else like helps kick in for it, that's because there was the, oh, we're not getting from point A to point B, let's just like make another route to get there. Um, but yeah, so we also, because we don't want, um, gray matter damage or neurons to die in like children's brains, we really need to be aware of like concussions and helmet safety. Like kids should always be wearing helmets when they're biking, when they're doing activities, when they're playing hockey, be really aware of concussions, right? Not that you have irreversible neuron damage, but there's the potential for that, right? Like um, though that like the biggest source of childhood injury is often like related to activities where a kid should have been wearing a helmet and they weren't. So really think about that because like, once a neuron dies, like that's it. We can still use what we have to try and make things work, but it's in the best interest of everyone. Just wear the helmet. Um, cultural practice, yeah. So kids, to be well, um, and we're getting close to the end here. So to be well, kids need to know where they come from. 
So they need to be connected to a land base, whether that land is a park that's near your house, whether it's your reserve, whether it's like your ancestral homelands, right? There is a lot of merit to children being physically and spiritually connected to a land base. Um, if this is applicable to you, this is applicable to me because I'm an Ashabek person, but like children need to know what their cons are and what their spirit names are. Often when I see teens, um, like, and they're like, you know, 16 and they're like alcohol withdrawal, like really like substance use is like kind of out of control. Um, I'm always curious and I always want to know if that person, um, knows their spirit name. Everyone has a spirit name and it's not like people, everyone has a spirit name. It's just a, like, like it exists in the ether. You just you need help retrieving it to know it. Um, and usually traditional medicine people can help you with that. But I'm definitely of the belief that like if kids know their spirit name and they're connected to that, then they have a sense of identity and they can move in the world knowing that they're grounded in their culture themselves and their identity. We want to create positive associations and emotions with culture. So like learning to fire a key, for example, I think that's like a really, when I see children or like really young kind of people doing that, I really like, like, am like, good job it's so amazing that you're doing that like you really want to reinforce that that's good behavior and that that's a good thing to do because they're taking care of the community powwow dancing physically moving your body sweat lodges beating whatever culture means to you maybe that isn't your culture or that those things you know you don't practice those things but create those positive associations because culture is what keeps our people well and then land-based learning so when you can try and do stuff that's outside right it naturally increases dopamine um, and children just generally feel more peaceful and calm um, we at Anwa have an indigenous healthy babies healthy children program um, so there is a brochure that's online um, essentially there's like different things there's like a whole variety of things that are offered so like there's stuff about nutrition there's stuff about development so like if you're you feel like you're struggling as a parent to um like parent um or like there's issues that you're having with your kids like definitely reach out to this um program to help you essentially like get support in order to be able to feel um like you can uh help your child and and help and by virtue help yourself make your life easier by being able to access some of these things um Parenting is hard. Um, resisting colonization every day is hard. So really give yourself some grace. So I, it makes me really sad when a, like parents come away from the talk and they're like, no, I messed up. And I'm like, no, you're parenting, you're doing the best you can. And know that people are always doing the best they can with the resources we have. Whether those resources are great, whether they're like, you know, ideal, up to you. But parenting is difficult. And I saw this, um, a couple of quotes on this um, WordPress document, it was Indigenous Motherhood WordPress. And it was just, it, I feel like it really resonated with like, we are also trying to raise healthy nations. We're trying to create less intergenerational trauma with our, our little kids. Um, and to be an Indigenous parent in today's eight, day and age means ensuring that your children um, are raised with weapons is the word used but you know raised with the tools of resistance and revitalization in order to defy colonial reconciliation and colonial assimilation because that's the thing right we're raising children but we're also having to teach them how to survive in a world that is not built for them in a world that has ongoing colonial processes right so really as a parent give yourself grace we have a lot going on um and so some like reaffirming things that i think is really helpful for you to fully believe in or to really um, commit yourself to doing this so i have done my best to heal my own traumas as an adult as a teenager as a parent as a grandparent and i am devoted to continue to heal my own traumas so as not to inflict harm on my own children right like that's like where we hear the like people break like um uh curse breakers like they're breaking the intergenerational um crappy things that are happening um by like making it stop like the cycle ends with you it stops with you so that you don't pass it on to your children right we have that there's like so much of that happening and it's such beautiful work um another i teach my children that all emotions are good emotions great i'm really glad you felt that i'm really glad that you're experiencing the breadth of what it means to be a human I respect myself enough to be in healthy relationships, especially for my children. 
this is a hard one, right? Because of course there are a lot of kids that witness domestic violence, like that, hence why we have shelters and, you know, pe but like, think of what you communicate to your child when you stay with a person that's verbally, emotionally, physically abusive and your child, like, what is it that you're communicating? What message is being sent to your child? It's that that's acceptable. It's okay to be treated that way and we should stick it out, right? And we don't want our kids, we want our, we don't want our future generations like stuck in these really healthy, toxic, violent relationships, right? So like stay, like be in or try to get out of relationships if it's like, it's that's in the best interest of your child to really just have healthy relationships. To, to see, you know, them um, adults get along or when there is a disagreement that they can resolve it, like that they can work through it like adults. Um, and also my children can cry whenever they feel they need to. Really do not punish or shame children for crying. It's such a vital piece of development. And also like I believe, and a lot of Anishinaabek people believe like their creator gave us certain ways to release like sickness or to release energy, to release emotion. Um, or to release like waste, things that are in our body that we don't need. So there's like, obviously the waste, you know, that goes into the toilet, but there's, there's the tears, there's the sweat, right? There's physical things that leave our body to help us excrete what we don't need. Crying is one of those things. And so I really think that when we don't allow children to cry and that trauma and whatever that, that, whatever it is that they're going through sits there and continues to just, it festers. And I do think that's what contributes to autoimmune disease in our communities and also why we have so many like rates of rheumatoid arthritis, cancer, things where your body is attacking itself. Well, we need to make sure we allow these things to happen. We allow our children to cry and to release. Okay. So um, in summary, this is the last slide. So we really want babies. So build, babies are building connection through day to day interactions um with their world with other people so the more they um see something the more something is represented the stronger that those connections those neural pathways are going to be um as your child grows myelination helps them process information more quickly so good nutrition is really going to help with that process um children prune connections that they don't need and they continue to practice what was reinforced so if we reinforce for our kid that like when they have meltdowns um they like yeah just i don't know we've given so many different examples of of, of that but um if you want your kids to be a certain way you have to have the repetition um, children learn best when they are happy and feel safe and secure. So really try and focus on regulating yourself. Um, there are definitely like prime time periods when the brain is especially like, um, primed for learning certain skills, but don't worry. It's not like one of those, like, I don't do everything right when he's two, he's going to turn into this awful person. It's not like that, right? We have neuroplasticity. There's the potential to change. Do what you can with the resources you can and do it as soon as you can, right? The sooner we intervene and the sooner we act when kids are in harm or when they're experiencing really crappy things in their lives, the, the more we help with their brain development. Okay, so that's everything. Um, I think we have some questions, which, yeah, it's five o'clock, so feel free to like log off if you're kind of like done. There's, I think there's just a couple that I'll... And your share screen. I'll end your screen. Okay, stop share. Okay, um, yeah, so if, if now you need to log off, that's totally fine. Um, just know that so the in the chat box, that's where the link to the survey is, please give us your feedback, your name. If you do the survey and then put your name associated with it, it'll be entered into a draw um, to win a prize and that will get mailed out to you. Our next talk is going to be August 10th, no, August 7th um, from 3 to 5 p.m. And it's going to be about gender affirming care. So that's stuff like trans like lgbtq um care hormones um like affirming surgeries all of that stuff um that's what that topic is going to be about in august um so if this is you leaving really lovely thank you so much for joining us and then for the folks who want to stay for the questions so um that's okay yeah 
you're a late groomer when your parents are not early learners teachers. Yeah, exactly. That's a really important. It's true. You are a late groomer when your parents aren't like helping you develop these skills, right? We get stuck in wherever psycho developmentally, wherever we kind of stopped, that's kind of where we're stuck and we need to go back and reparent ourselves to then get through that developmental stage. So you're totally right. I'm grateful for this. I wish I learned this when I was a young mom. I'm a 60 scoop survivor. So I did live with constant anxiety. Absolutely. Now I'm older and I plan to class on the teachings. Miigwech. Well, thank you so much. Um, I'm really glad to hear that like this knowledge was, was useful. And I'm also deeply sorry that this, this information wasn't available um, for you. That's true of a lot of 60 scoop survivors and residential school survivors and that sort of gap of, of people in our community who like really struggled and like Honestly, the fact that you lived and made it through that is testament enough to the kind of parent that you are. Good job staying alive. Um, thank you. I really enjoyed this session. Amazing presentation. Excited to join the next one. You watch. Okay. Great. So those were the comments. Those were the questions. Yep, there's one other question. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone. Have a good rest of your day. Bye for now.